I'd never travelled at all as a child. I was 18 when I first went abroad. You see, we'd always had family holidays in our own country. I think Dad knew he couldn't cope with the hassle of taking a big family abroad. But when I was 18, he paid for me to fly to Switzerland for a mountain walking holiday with a touring group. In many ways, I didn't know what to expect. I guess I thought flying might be quite scary, but in the event, I was actually rather disappointed when we had to get off. On the runway, I just couldn't believe the views. We were completely surrounded by snow-capped mountains, and from that moment on, I was well and truly hooked on travel. Speaker 2 well, travelling abroad was nothing new for me, as my mother's actually Canadian, so most summers we flew over there and stayed with my aunts and uncles. So my first solo trip wasn't the big deal it might have been. Canada's a long way to go alone when you're 20, but it was second nature to me, really. I just had to organise myself, whereas before it had all been done for me. And that's quite a big step, and you have no choice but to rise to the challenge. It's a case of sink or swim, really. Fortunately, I swam. Speaker 3 Believe it or not, the first time I actually went independently was a business trip to Russia. I'd been overseas dozens of times with family and friends, always with somebody. It was a great eye-opener. The whole thing of airports, planes, connections is a whole lot more intense somehow when it's just you. Make a mistake and you're reliant on yourself to sort it out. And I'd say it also intensifies the whole experience of your trip. Maybe because you've got a lot more time to think about it and make your own decisions. You soak up the atmosphere, the experience of being overseas, that much more. Speaker 4 My first time abroad was on an English language course in Australia. It was all so new and exciting for me that I'm not sure I really had any expectations. I went into it with an open mind. I suppose one preconception I had as a city dweller of a vast country with loads of countryside to explore never really got put to the test. I spent all the time in the city of Perth. And, well, city living is city living pretty much anywhere, isn't it? I'd say your first time abroad alone is the making of you. It makes you much more independent and confident in your life. Speaker 5 I'd flown before with my family, but when I was 21, I was a really keen runner and I saw this advert for a big marathon event in Japan. I thought this was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, as everything was organised for you, except, of course, you had to fly by yourself. I knew Japan was supposed to be a really efficient place where everything works well and runs on time. And once I was there, the local organisation was first class. But unfortunately, I couldn't say the same about the trip home, as I had numerous problems with delayed flights and such like. Now listen to the recording again. Extract 1 I spent last year working in Beijing, and one of my most memorable days off was a visit to the Daxing Watermelon Festival, which takes place every year in May. Chinese farmers from this district, which lies to the south of the city, come together to celebrate their harvest and compete for the best watermelon prize. The watermelons are judged on a combination of factors. Now, I love watermelons, and what counts for me is that the fruit is juicy and relatively free of seeds when I bite into it. But for these growers, what matters a lot is how heavy their produce is, and there were some mighty specimens on show. The thickness of the skin and how it looks is also a make-or-break issue for the experts, but that's kind of irrelevant to a consumer like me. There's far more to this event than winning prizes, though, I was particularly struck by the training opportunities on offer to farmers, and there are things for tourists to engage with too, as well as souvenirs and watermelons to purchase. Quite apart from that, the festival provides a venue for business deals with its trade fair. Everyone should attend this festival at least once in their life.
I spent last year working in Beijing, and one of my most memorable days off was a visit to the Daxing Watermelon Festival, which takes place every year in May. Chinese farmers from this district, which lies to the south of the city, come together to celebrate their harvest and compete for the best watermelon prize. The watermelons are judged on a combination of factors. Now, I love watermelons, and what counts for me is that the fruit is juicy and relatively free of seeds when I bite into it. But for these growers, what matters a lot is how heavy their produce is, and there were some mighty specimens on show. The thickness of the skin and how it looks is also a make-or-break issue for the experts, but that's kind of irrelevant to a consumer like me. There's far more to this event than winning prizes, though. I was particularly struck by the training opportunities on offer to farmers, and there are things for tourists to engage with too, as well as souvenirs and watermelons to purchase. Quite apart from that, the festival provides a venue for business deals with its trade fair. Everyone should attend this festival at least once in their life. Extract two. Sabrina, you've been thumbing through some of the titles in a new series, which showcases the best culinary authors down the centuries. What can you tell us about this series? Well, they're concise and straightforward volumes. The perfect antidote to the typical glossy publishing we've been served up for the last couple of decades.、Mm. You know, big hardbacks with mouth-watering photography, but which are at the end of the day thin on content, and can even be a bit disappointing from time to time for the creative cook.、Hmm. By contrast, these books open up new vistas without any illustrations whatsoever. Just very informative and often hilarious text.、Hmm, sounds intriguing.、Uh, can you give us a concrete example? Yes, indeed. Though it's hard to pick out just one from the many gems here. <laughs> I adored reading the 18th-century writer William Verrill, whose recipes from the White Hart Inn are so evocative of another era in cooking and hygiene standards. <laughs> He talks about the challenges of cooking without the best implements, describing a frying pan as being as black as my hat, <laughs> and this is refreshingly different from what we're all used to. A few other writers in the series are just as witty, but none comes up with observations like Verrill's. Some of his recipes are strikingly modern in feel and easy to recreate more than two hundred years on. So worth trying if you. Sabrina, you've been thumbing through some of the titles in a new series, which showcases the best culinary authors down the centuries. What can you tell us about this series? Well, they're concise and straightforward volumes. The perfect antidote to the typical glossy publishing we've been served up for the last couple of decades,、mm. you know, big hardbacks with mouth-watering photography, but which are at the end of the day thin on content, and can even be a bit disappointing from time to time for the creative cook.、Mm. By contrast, these books open up new vistas without any illustrations whatsoever. Just very informative and often hilarious text.、Mm, sounds intriguing. Can you give us a concrete example? Yes, indeed. Though it's hard to pick out just one from the many gems here, <laughs> I adored reading the 18th-century writer William Verrill, whose recipes from the White Hart Inn are so evocative of another era in cooking and hygiene standards. <laughs> He talks about the challenges of cooking without the best implements, describing a frying pan as being as black as my hat, <laughs> and this is refreshingly different from what we're all used to. A few other writers in the series are just as witty, but none comes up with observations like Verrill's. Some of his recipes are strikingly modern in feel and easy to recreate more than two hundred years on. So worth trying if you. Extract three. My husband and I took our son Jack and his girlfriend to a very classy restaurant to celebrate their graduation. We were really looking forward to the experience, as we knew from friends that the menu would be special, and it most certainly was. Jack and his girlfriend aren't meat eaters, so they went for an exquisite-looking medley of grilled aubergines, peppers, and goodness knows what else, served on a bed of couscous. They found it appetising enough, but seemed to hanker after my blackened cod, which I must admit tasted heavenly, even if its appearance was less than perfect. 
my husband relished his extremely tender and well-seasoned steak, but again, I felt the way it was arranged on the plate lacked originality. We were seated comfortably at a round oak table in the middle of the room, which was done out in subtle shades of blue and cream, all very tasteful, though the general ambience left something to be desired. With so many waiters dashing about over the wooden floorboards, it was hard to hear ourselves speak at times, and the net result was a tiny bit soulless. Still, the food lived up to our expectations and was worth every penny. My husband and I took our son Jack and his girlfriend to a very classy restaurant to celebrate their graduation. We were really looking forward to the experience, as we knew from friends that the menu would be special. And it most certainly was. Jack and his girlfriend aren't meat-eaters, so they went for an exquisite-looking medley of grilled aubergines, peppers and goodness knows what else, served on a bed of couscous. They found it appetising enough, but seemed to hanker after my blackened cod, which I must admit tasted heavenly, even if its appearance was less than perfect. My husband relished his extremely tender and well-seasoned steak, but again, I felt the way it was arranged on the plate lacked originality. We were seated comfortably at a round oak table in the middle of the room, which was done out in subtle shades of blue and cream, all very tasteful, though the general ambience left something to be desired. With so many waiters dashing about over the wooden floorboards, it was hard to hear ourselves speak at times, and the net result was a tiny bit soulless. Still, the food lived up to our expectations and was worth every penny. Hello, my name's William Bond, and I'm a freelance musician. I'm going to talk to you about an unusual project I've been involved in. But first, a bit of background about myself. Freelance work is obviously really varied. Naturally, I've got some private pupils who I give piano or singing lessons to. I also do some work for a local school. I did some consultancy work for them on how to carry out assessment of musical performance, which was very well paid and makes up for the times I've been called in at two hours' notice to substitute for a music teacher who's ill. Also, I occasionally give recitals in either piano or organ, but to be honest, unless you're a brilliant professional performer, that kind of work means hundreds of hours' practice and planning for almost no reward. So that side of things you tend to do to make a name for yourself and get contacts in the musical world. You could say it's a form of networking, I suppose. Something that all freelance people do in the business world. Finally, I do a lot of work, more and more in fact, in the world of opera. I get hired by various opera companies as orchestral conductor, or else as the repetiteur. That's the industry name for the person who trains up the singers behind the scenes. Um, or even as overall musical director. In fact, that's what I've been doing for the last few weeks. To be honest, these roles can overlap somewhat. Well, anyway, that brings me nicely to what I was mainly going to talk to you about today. And that's an opera for young homeless people I did last year. What happened was, I heard about a charity organisation which operates a day centre come night hostel for homeless people in a northern city. I volunteered to do some music therapy workshops, you know, expressing yourself through music. Well, I got talking with the manager of the centre and we came up with an idea. To stage an opera created and performed by the homeless people themselves. She then put this proposal to a body called the Arts Council and, to our surprise, they agreed, without hesitation, to fund the whole project. So, that's what we did. A local poet called Jennifer Matthews worked with the guys, getting them to come up with ideas for lyrics and storylines, and then she went away and turned it all into a script. I did the same with the music, transforming their ideas into something workable, which fitted with the lyrics. 
Often, what I'd get from them was, say, a first line of a song, which served as a kind of prompt for me to follow, or sometimes they might just give me a particular mood that a song should convey, or energy, to use their actual term for it. That's the way of working we established, with me agreeing to respect their wishes as far as possible, and they in turn leaving me to use my expertise to knock it all into shape. It was actually one of the most challenging things I've ever done. Rather bizarre, to be honest, because a lot of the ideas in the storyline were so surreal, they sounded like they were something out of a dream. And I had somehow to put it all within the framework of music for classical theatre. Also, what they wanted as individuals was, of course, very subjective, and this led to a very eclectic mix, from R&B music to garage music to goodness knows what. If I exposed them to some classical stuff, I, in turn, learnt a lot about rap. Which, let's just say, I hadn't exactly had occasion to deal with before, but which I rather took to after a while. So, quite an eye-opener for me. Anyway... Together, Jennifer and I developed the opera partly on thematic lines. For example, we noticed that water happened to feature heavily in the guy's ideas, which were fantastically imaginative. One guy called Dave did a song about someone standing on a beach and watching a pirate ship, and another called Lewis about what it would be like to be in a rowing boat all alone, surrounded by deep blue water. There was a clear connection here, so we backed these two pieces together and accompanied them with a background track that had all kinds of water noises, such as a storm at sea and rain on a roof, which I thought was especially effective. It opened with a dripping tap, and that went down really well with everyone watching. Clever stuff, eh? Now, moving on to the special effects. Now listen to the recording again. Unit 8. Urban Jungle. Exercise 1. You will hear three different extracts. For questions 1 to 6, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. There are two questions for each extract. Extract 1. Recently, I went back to the city where I grew up and saw the old family home again after 25 years. The great thing about it then was the city was small and we were just a couple of kilometres from the city centre and yet also about the same distance from very pleasant countryside. But now you can see the city sprawled outwards. There's a motorway and a new suburban development, as others have observed. So now that I have a family of my own, I'm beginning to look quite nostalgically to that era as I think we had the best of both worlds then in terms of our location. I think city life's getting more and more fraught in this country. People are getting sick to the back teeth of all the hassle of urban living, not least the semi-permanent gridlock, and look through rose-tinted spectacles at other less populated parts of the country. Where I live, up in the north, there's tons more space and fantastic air quality, but there's also high unemployment. The money's in the south. That's where all the jobs and development are. It's a situation with no answer, really. There's no happy medium. Recently, I went back to the city where I grew up and saw the old family home again after 25 years. The great thing about it then was the city was small and we were just a couple of kilometres from the city centre and yet also about the same distance from very pleasant countryside. But now you can see the city sprawled outwards. There's a motorway and a new suburban development, as others have observed. So now that I have a family of my own, I'm beginning to look quite nostalgically to that era, as I think we had the best of both worlds then in terms of our location. I think city life's getting more and more fraught in this country. People are getting sick to the back teeth of all the hassle of urban living, not least the semi-permanent gridlock, and look through rose-tinted spectacles at other less populated parts of the country. Where I live, up in the north, there's tons more space and fantastic air quality, 
but there's also high unemployment. The money's in the South. That's where all the jobs and developments are. It's a situation with no answer, really. There's no happy medium. Extract 2 What do you think about the Regal Hotel? It's certainly a majestic old building. It is, and that's the image they try to project. But frankly, I think they hide behind that dignified facade and get away with murder. Oh. The management there. Really? Yes. There's a stately air about it, but stately easily becomes decrepit. The building's definitely seen better days, and you get the feeling they rather paper over the cracks, as it were. I see. And what about the staff? They're famously well-mannered, I thought. To the point of being obsequious. They fawn all over you, which always makes me feel thoroughly uncomfortable, in fact. Especially at breakfast time. Oh. It reminds me of the master and servant thing, whereas I'd much rather just go and help myself to what I want. A self-service thing? Or, or a buffet? Yes. Then it'd all be much quicker, and I wouldn't have to keep on saying thank you umpteen times. What do you think about the Regal Hotel? It's certainly a majestic old building. It is, and that's the image they try to project. But frankly, I think they hide behind that dignified facade and get away with murder. Oh. The management there. Really? Yes. There's a stately air about it, but stately easily becomes decrepit. The building's definitely seen better days, and you get the feeling they rather paper over the cracks, as it were. I see. And what about the staff? They're famously well-mannered, I thought. To the point of being obsequious. They fawn all over you, which always makes me feel thoroughly uncomfortable, in fact. Especially at breakfast time. Oh. It reminds me of the master and servant thing, whereas I'd much rather just go and help myself to what I want. A self-service thing? Or, or a buffet? Yes. Then it'd all be much quicker, and I wouldn't have to keep on saying thank you umpteen times. Extract 3 So, do you still run a car now you live in the centre of town? I do, but to be honest, it's a liability. The street's so narrow, you can virtually say goodbye to any chance of ever getting out at busy times. Have they not heard of a one-way system? <laughs> Apparently not. There are cars permanently parked on both sides of the street, so it's a recipe for chaos, really. So you must be really lucky to have a parking space. <laughs> well, you'd think so. But actually, it's often counterproductive to use your car. If I ever move mine, I know there'll be no spaces by the time I get back. It's completely crazy. So the irony is, as a car owner, you're better off using public transport. <laughs> but I don't really understand. I mean, do you not have a parking permit? I do. And permits are only for residents. But the thing is, you're not actually assigned to a particular space. And that's perhaps where the system falls down. Oh, I see. So your documentation means you can park anywhere in the street. Hmm. Yes, that does sound likely to cause problems. And is it also that there are more permits and spaces? Yes, because some residents are also allowed a visitor's permit, people who are elderly or need help. Not that I begrudge them that, they couldn't manage without it. But it does swell the numbers. So, do you still run a car now you live in the centre of town? I do, but to be honest, it's a liability. The street's so narrow, you can virtually say goodbye to any chance of ever getting out at busy times. Have they not heard of a one-way system? <laughs> Apparently not. There are cars permanently parked on both sides of the street, so it's a recipe for chaos, really. So you must be really lucky to have a parking space. <laughs> well, you'd think so. But actually, it's often counterproductive to use your car. If I ever move mine, I know there'll be no spaces by the time I get back. It's completely crazy. So the irony is, as a car owner, you're better off using public transport. <laughs> but I don't really understand. I mean, do you not have a parking permit? I do. And permits are only for residents. But the thing is, you're not actually assigned to a particular space. And that's perhaps where the system falls down. Oh, I see. So your documentation means you can park anywhere in the street. Hmm. Yes, that does sound likely to cause problems. And is it also that there are more permits and spaces? Yes, because some residents are also allowed a visitor's permit. 
people who are elderly or need help. Not that I begrudge them that, they couldn't manage without it, but it does swell the numbers. Unit 10. Globalisation. Exercise 1. You will hear part of a discussion programme in which a businessman called David and a linguist called Ivana are speaking about the theme of symbols. For questions 1 to 5, choose the answer A, B, C or D, which fits best according to what you hear. Well, as you know, Ivana, my line of business is marketing, and there's a lot of symbolism there. Success often comes down to who's projected the most successful image to the public, right? So, companies spend millions on updating their logos to suggest a company with class, or tradition, or innovative ideas. So, this is really brand symbolism you're talking about? Exactly. Now, in my company, we looked into how we could reach out to our customers on an emotional level with something very positive and familiar. And we came up with the idea of incorporating a tick sign into our logo. So, in time, we hope this symbol will come to represent our brand. Yes, I was reading about this. Apparently, the best brands symbolise something beyond merely a commercial transaction, though. They really connect to an idea that resonates with people, something cultural, maybe, so that people really get a sense of belonging. Hmm, interesting stuff. And it's also often said that modern life is full of symbols of globalisation, popular cultural icons like Madonna and Coca-Cola. Mm. I'd argue that even the internet itself is a symbol of globalisation because of the interconnectedness that it brings to everything in life nowadays. Mm, point taken. On social websites, you can interact with the whole world within minutes. In the same breath, I'd also mention big global sporting events like the World Cup and the Olympic Games, symbols of sport bringing friendship and happiness between nations. They've also brought their fair share of political controversy, but perhaps that's just me being cynical. <laughs> no, you're right. There's a long history of various countries using such events for political ends. But I also think people are wise to this more and more. In any case, these events always seem to turn out very successful, even if you can doubt the intention behind them. But my subject, language, also strikes me as highly symbolic because often words have a deeper significance than their purely literal meaning. Right. For example? OK, well, if I say that so-and-so can run as fast as the wind, I don't really mean that. It's just a way of speaking. Mm. So the wind becomes a symbol of the person's speed. Yes. It's like if you say something like, uh, a steady stream of people trickle down the hillside. <laughs> I think that one's technically a metaphor, isn't it? You're right, and this is a feature of language in general, although the speaker wouldn't think of it as symbolic. But then writers do consciously make use of strong personal symbols. The novelist Charles Dickens used the image of fog to symbolise the confusion of the legal profession in London, for example. Hmm, I see. But there's also a wider point. Language can be a symbol for culture. Obviously, people think differently in different cultures, and their language reflects their different beliefs. There are words in some languages that don't have an equivalent in other languages. Hmm. Anyway, moving the discussion on to other walks of life, what about sport? I play for a weekend hockey team called Walshingham Wolves, and the wolf appears on our club emblem. It's on the badge on our shirt. You get this with sports teams. They take up the symbol of a dragon or a lion or something, and that also becomes the club's nickname. So, we're the Wolves. <laughs> Our supporters say this symbolises the aggressive style of hockey we play. <laughs> but that's clearly not the case. Basically, the whole Wolves thing is just about alliteration. The word sounds good alongside Walshingham. Mind you, I suppose if you have a fierce-sounding name, then it helps your team spirit and motivation. <laughs> I couldn't imagine playing for a team called the Lambs. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> OK, well, another aspect of our theme is colour symbolism. There was a thing on the news recently about how, in this country, car insurance companies actually charge more for people with red cars because red symbolises anger and aggression. Mm. So they think if you choose a red car, it must mean you'll take more risks. Oh, that does seem completely over the top to me. 
my neighbours labelled more of a risk than me because of the paint on his vehicle. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, come to think of it, I'm sure I've heard that red cars attract lower insurance here because a red car is highly visible in different weather conditions. That just shows how illogical it all is. <laughs> I suppose the point really is. Now listen to the recording again. Unit 12. At the cutting edge. Exercise 1. You will hear five short extracts in which different people are talking about the internet. Look at task 1. For questions 1 to 5, choose from the list A to H what each speaker's attitude is towards the internet. Now look at task 2. For questions 6 to 10, choose from the list A to H what each speaker currently uses the internet for most. While you listen, you must complete both tasks. Speaker 1 I've always known that the internet was essential for my work, and I'm on email fairly regularly. I'd say over the past year or two, though, I've become much more open to its many other uses, not least online shopping, which I'm totally addicted to. As I've got a bit more hands-on with the net, the last thing I've moved to is online banking. The fact is, I've always felt that if hackers can get into the top-secret military systems, they're not going to have much problem finding out my bank details. Anyway, I have now signed up on the understanding that the system is foolproof, without being 100% convinced. Speaker 2 I'm well and truly incapable of seeing any point in constantly networking socially, often with people who you wouldn't give the time of day to if you met them in the street, to give insignificant details about what you've been doing today, as if anyone cares except yourself. However, I will say I have used a friend's page to track down an old friend, so perhaps there's a silver lining in that particular cloud. One thing I do use it regularly for is checking train times. I often have meetings on the other side of the country in connection with work. I can buy my ticket on the train, though. Speaker 3 Yeah, I use it a lot. I'm forever checking out the last match report for the team I support. <laughs> I go all over the country to watch them in my spare time. I also surf occasionally for money tips. You know, which shares are doing well. Not that they're always right. You can do all sorts of things on the internet nowadays. Though whether that's a good thing is another matter. It's completely unregulated. And with that comes undesirable aspects to it. But that's only to be expected, I suppose. On balance, I'd say it's probably a force for good. It'll be interesting to see what it looks like ten years from now. Speaker 4 I think it's astounding the sheer amount of useful information you can now access at the push of a button. It's way beyond my comprehension. I also get completely thrown when technical messages appear on the screen requiring an instant decision. I'm never in a position to make one. Some of it isn't for me. I can't express any enthusiasm for chat rooms, for one thing. But I do often browse the net, and only this morning I subscribed to an online cycling magazine. What I find it invaluable for, though, is investigating background issues to do with the companies I devise and run training courses for. Speaker 5 Well, I'm a record producer, and I seem to have spent most of my last week online listening to various girls singing. It's all for my old boss, in return for something she did for me. I'll be pleased when it's over and done, as I'm not earning a penny from it. One thing that does really annoy me about the internet is the way it encourages anybody and everybody to make uninformed comments that can be read anywhere in the world. People give their opinions, often in bad English, or else seem to be experts, when in fact they've just copied something they've seen on a reputable site. There's no way of stopping this, but technically, it's illegal. Now listen to the recording again. Unit 14. Get fit, 
Live longer. Exercise 1. You will hear part of a program in which a coach called Rob Johnson and a physiotherapist called Donna Davies are discussing health and fitness. For questions 1 to 5, choose the answer A, B, C or D, which fits best according to what you hear. <laughs> nice one, Donna. Very amusing. Thanks, Rob. Now, something I wanted to ask you was, you're a swimming coach. Mm -hmm. Do you actually think there is a best sport for fitness? Are my guys any fitter than boxers or sprinters? Hmm. The question's only relevant if you're a member of the public looking to get fit from a starting point of not already being fit. Then, yes, you should look at tapping into some swimming, some running, some gym work, because you'll benefit from all of them. But fitness at a higher level is sports-specific. A true swimmer can't train like a boxer, and a boxer can't train like a gymnast. Mm -hmm. And within that, a sprint swimmer is an entirely different animal from a distant swimmer. So who's to say which of them is fitter? Neither can do what the other can, so really, at that level, it's a complete non-question. Yes, that's interesting, and I think you make an important point about what fitness is and what it means. Mm. I would add that in the general fitness mass market, what we can see is that there's always been a tendency to equate fitness with how far you can go. Yes, an 80-kilometre bike ride is seen as a measure of fitness. But without wanting to sound aloof and snooty, it might have taken a whole day's riding on a tip-top racing-style bike, in which case it means almost nothing in terms of fitness. Generally, faster and shorter can be equated with fitter, and casual trainers would probably benefit more from, say, the greater muscle tone that that would bring. Mm. Endurance is just one aspect of a much wider picture, but it's the thing that people grab onto. Hmm. Let me move things on to another aspect of fitness, and that's cross-training. That's one of the buzzwords of the moment, and cyclists are off running, and runners are out swimming, and all in the belief it'll help them improve in their own sport. Now, if you're just in the general fitness market and you're not seriously competing in one sport, I'm all for doing it eclectically like that. But if you're a serious cyclist, then it's a moot point whether you'll benefit from going off and doing some rowing. Mm -hmm. Well, you get stronger all round, that's true. But once you get back on your bike, it's back to your leg muscles. And having stronger arms, if it comes with added bulk, is actually going to be a hindrance. I agree. For serious sports people, I think it has potential value in terms of injury prevention. But think of a sprint runner. Now, obviously, too much sprinting puts a real strain on the body, not least because you're up on your toes all the time, so your feet and legs really take a battering. Mm. So, understandably, some coaches look to incorporate swimming into the training programme. But swim too much and the sprinter will lose some muscle bulk and they'll then have less power to bring to bear on their running. Mm. So cross-training ceases to be effective if it becomes anything other than something supplementary to your regular training. Mm. So, Donna, as a sports physiotherapist, would you advise people wanting to get fit to head for the gym? Each to his own, really. The key thing is what you enjoy and what's going to continue to get you going. I must admit, if you're pushing me for a personal view, I do balk a bit at seeing people walking on treadmills in gyms, <laughs> especially when they can see the hills behind the town from the gym I use. <laughs> but anyway, the gym is always going to be useful to different people in different ways. Yes, clearly. I'm actually using the gym to treat a long-distance skier at the moment, not the downhill type, the cross-country variety on the flat. In my view, this sport is wonderful for your heart and lungs, but in fact uses a highly repetitive motion that isn't actually natural at all. So there's another issue. Predictability. Sports like this are at the top end of predictability in that the muscles do the same relatively confined action again and again. Mm. My patient's got a serious overuse injury and we're doing a whole body rehabilitation to strengthen bones and joints. So I'm making him do completely unpredictable muscle movements, things that the likes of gymnasts and wrestlers do. Hmm, very interesting. So, Rob, you're one of the healthiest individuals I've seen. Do you equate fitness with health? <laughs> That's a hard one. I mean, we all know someone to whom sport is complete anathema, but who's the very picture of health? Hmm, we do. But I wonder how old that someone is. I bet you they don't go on being paragons of health well into middle age. 
maybe, and I suppose those who've taken care of themselves earlier in life do get less problems later on. Mm. Then again, overexerting yourself can no doubt lead to lowered resistance to infection. You're not wrong there. So it swings and roundabouts, really. <laughs> I guess so. Now listen to the recording again. Unit 16. Hidden Nuances. Exercise 1. You will hear five short extracts in which different people are talking about trying to write their first novel. Look at task 1. For questions 1 to 5, choose from the list A to H how each person felt during the experience. Now look at task 2. For questions 6 to 10, choose from the list A to H what each person learned. While you listen, you must complete both tasks. Speaker 1. I tried to do a novel to a carefully thought out formula. I figured that increasingly people want a lighter read these days, as they don't have time to read enormously long books. So I kept it light and easy with self-contained chapters. The publisher I sent it to applauded my well-reasoned attempt to do something different, but said that it didn't cut much ice. That was a valuable lesson for me. It wasn't that hard to write, and I seemed to rattle on at a fair old pace, but one thing that did trouble me was writing descriptive passages. That's always been one of my failings, to be honest, and I could sense it myself when I reread it. Speaker 2 From the outset, I decided to employ a friend who would comment on the material. What she picked up was that I was falling into the trap of telling things too clearly and directly, doing all the work for the reader. That had never occurred to me. Overall, I have no regrets about doing the novel, even if it was simply a labour of love. But I would say, at times, I felt it was an isolating experience when I'd go whole days without feeling part of the world at large. At times, I was tempted to put in something that would shock the reader. But in the end, I'm glad I didn't resort to this. Speaker 3 I knew more or less what kind of novel I wanted to write, and I spent six months reading up on published novels on similar themes. See, I had it all ruthlessly planned. But that approach had its drawbacks. At times, I was probably too influenced by them, to be honest. I don't think I ever suffered from writer's block, as it's called. If anything, it was the opposite for me. I noticed early on that I had a tendency to ramble and get a bit long-winded. This is something I taught myself to avoid, so it never got to be a problem. My instinct was that I should keep everything true to the real world, and I think this shines through. Speaker 4 I knew I had very little chance of getting accepted by a publisher if I sent my work in unsolicited. So I got a literary agent interested by sending him a couple of chapters. He agreed to comment on what I'd done so far, and his point was that there seemed to be some very bland parts where I was just going through the motions. I put this down to a daily nine-to-five working schedule I'd imposed on the task and agreed to free this up. Later on, I got to one bit which, although I was very pleased with it, was rather contentious. And I must admit, it did leave me wondering how it would be received by readers. <laughs> Speaker 5 I made a conscious effort to write from the heart and put my own experiences into the work, within a preordained framework I'd worked out. Even so, at times the manuscript seemed to develop a mind of its own and go off in a direction I hadn't envisaged. It was exciting to get swept along, but in a way, I didn't really want it to happen. It was my first attempt at a novel, and it became clear to me that you need a kind of hook to draw the reader in, and you need to keep on repeating this trick to make sure you've got the reader's attention. Now listen to the recording again. Unit 18. Freedom. Exercise 1. You will hear three different extracts. For questions 1 to 6, choose the answer A, B or C 
which fits best according to what you hear. There are two questions for each extract. Extract 1 I think you and I, relatively speaking, have got it very easy. Cushy jobs, easy lifestyle, a bit of stress, OK. But we've never properly experienced true freedom because we've never had anything big to struggle against. I know what you're saying, but you can still taste freedom in a diluted form. I had an operation in hospital recently, and after it I felt a great sense of freedom, release, relief, call it what you will. Just this wonderful feeling that from now on things could only get better. I guess you're right. I had quite a dilemma a few years ago, when I was in this high-pressure job with a boss I didn't care for. Out of the blue one day, my old boss from my previous job rang to ask if I could come back in a more senior role. It meant a considerable pay cut and a feeling of going back down in the world. The easy thing to do would have been to stay put and avoid any hassle. But in the end, I did it. And as you say, I felt, for want of a better word, a sense of freedom. I think you and I, relatively speaking, have got it very easy. Cushy jobs, easy lifestyle, a bit of stress, OK. But we've never properly experienced true freedom because we've never had anything big to struggle against. I know what you're saying, but you can still taste freedom in a diluted form. I had an operation in hospital recently, and after it I felt a great sense of freedom, release, relief, call it what you will. Just this wonderful feeling that from now on things could only get better. I guess you're right. I had quite a dilemma a few years ago, when I was in this high-pressure job with a boss I didn't care for. Out of the blue one day, my old boss from my previous job rang to ask if I could come back in a more senior role. It meant a considerable pay cut and a feeling of going back down in the world. The easy thing to do would have been to stay put and avoid any hassle. But in the end, I did it. And, as you say, I felt, for want of a better word, a sense of freedom. Extract 2 It's well documented that I'd quit my course at the Royal Institute of Music, so I was classically trained. But I broke off with it because my gut instinct was that it wasn't for me. It was all too controlled and mainstream. And I guess I was too much of a rebel. I wanted to take liberties with the rhythm, run with an idea and see where it took me. But you see, I now acknowledge that I couldn't possibly have done this, couldn't have achieved everything I subsequently did in my career without the background I had. It gave me a launching pad from which to branch off on a different angle. Am I returning to my classical roots? No. It's not a case of me changing because I'm getting older. But perhaps what's changed in me is a willingness to acknowledge my debt a little bit. With today's younger pop stars and composers, what they're schooled in is the idea that it's all about just go out and create. But you see, you can't create in a vacuum. You need a starting point. And for me, that was rejection of the norms and celebrating the freedom that gave me. It's well documented that I quit my course at the Royal Institute of Music, so I was classically trained, but I broke off with it because my gut instinct was that it wasn't for me. It was all too controlled and mainstream, and I guess I was too much of a rebel. I wanted to take liberties with the rhythm, run with an idea and see where it took me. But you see, I now acknowledge that I couldn't possibly have done this, couldn't have achieved everything I subsequently did in my career without the background I had. It gave me a launching pad from which to branch off on a different angle. Am I returning to my classical roots? No, it's not a case of me changing because I'm getting older. But perhaps what's changed in me is a willingness to acknowledge my debt a little bit. With today's younger pop stars and composers, what they're schooled in is the idea that it's all about just 
go out and create. But you see, you can't create in a vacuum. You need a starting point. And for me, that was rejection of the norms and celebrating the freedom that gave me. Extract 3 with me is journalist Lucy Waters. Lucy, what are your feelings on the state of press freedom? First and foremost, as a journalist, I believe that being free to express yourself is a universal human right. Mm. Politicians shouldn't be able to curb it in any way. After all, in a democratic society, there needs to be an open society so that the people can make informed judgments, and they do that with the help of the press. Mm -hmm. I know journalists have come in for quite a bit of stick recently as a result of a number of scandals, and I can't condone that, but the majority of us do abide by the rules. Mm. What do you think about the rules that are in place at present? We're lucky not to face too much censorship, but it's not all plain sailing. In Britain, there are libel laws, the Official Secrets Act, not to mention a host of other laws. Mm. But at least the police need a court order before they can force us to reveal our sources. There has always been, though, a culture of official secrecy in this country, and it took until 2000, with the Freedom of Information Act, for people to legally find out certain information. Amazing when you think about it. Hmm. With me is journalist Lucy Waters. Lucy, what are your feelings on the state of press freedom? First and foremost, as a journalist, I believe that being free to express yourself is a universal human right. Mm. Politicians shouldn't be able to curb it in any way. After all, in a democratic society, there needs to be an open society so that the people can make informed judgments, and they do that with the help of the press. Mm -hmm. I know journalists have come in for quite a bit of stick recently as a result of a number of scandals, and I can't condone that, but the majority of us do abide by the rules. Mm. What do you think about the rules that are in place at present? We're lucky not to face too much censorship, but it's not all plain sailing. In Britain, there are libel laws, the Official Secrets Act, not to mention a host of other laws. Mm. But at least the police need a court order before they can force us to reveal our sources. There has always been, though, a culture of official secrecy in this country, and it took until 2000, with the Freedom of Information Act, for people to legally find out certain information. Amazing when you think about it. Hmm. Unit 20. A sense of humour. Exercise 1. You are going to hear a talk from a woman called Emma Coleman about university student pranks or practical jokes. For questions 1 to 9, complete the sentences with a word or short phrase. Over the years, British and American university students in particular have become famous for pranks. These practical jokes can be quite ambitious and high profile, but they're all in good humour and nobody ever gets hurt. Arguably the most ingenious student prank of all time was carried out in June 1958, when the people of Cambridge woke to an unusual sight. A car was perched on a university rooftop, looking for all the world as if it were driving across the skyline. It made the headlines all around the world, leaving police, firefighters and civil defence units battling to work out a way of getting it back down. Only in the last few years have we learnt the identity of the mastermind behind the stunt. One Peter Davy, an engineering student at Gonville and Keys College, who hatched the plan while looking out of his college bedroom window over to the Senate House roof. Now, the Senate House building is used mainly for degree ceremonies, so it's very much in the public eye, and it's situated between King's College and Gonville and Keys. Peter recruited 11 other students to help realise his plan. After finding a clapped out car, an Austin 7, the group had to tow it through Cambridge to a parking space near the Senate House. They hit on the idea of sticking signs on it advertising a college dance to explain its presence. A ground party manoeuvred the car into position while a lifting party on the Senate House roof hoisted it up using an A-shaped crane constructed from scaffolding poles and steel rope. A third group, the bridge party, passed a plank across the notorious Senate House Leap, a three-metre gap between the roof and a turret window at Gonville and Keys. 
and help the lifters ferry across lifting gear comprising three types of rope, hooks and pulleys. Policemen who heard a commotion as the equipment passed above them questioned some of the ground party, but their attention was taken up with some careless drivers nearby, and so they left the students alone. The mechanics of the prank baffled onlookers. Three rowers returning to college after a night on the town spotted the car swinging about 12 metres up. Goodness knows what it must have looked like in the dark. A tent flapping in the wind, maybe? They were fobbed off with the explanation that it was a tethered balloon. The stunt almost went awry when the team tried to swing the car through the apex of the A-frame over the Senate House balustrade and it fell onto the roof. The next day, the bizarre sight enthralled crowds of onlookers and attempts by the authorities to construct a crane to hoist it back down failed. They eventually gave up on that plan and took it to pieces with blowtorches. The dean of the college had an inkling who was responsible and sent them a congratulatory case of champagne, while maintaining in public he knew nothing of the culprits. In fact, the shadowy group of engineering students who executed the stunt were until recently never identified, and the mystery of how they did it baffled generations of undergraduates. It also provided interesting material for tour guides. Such people must have been rather put out when, 50 years after the great event, in 2008, the group reunited at an anniversary dinner to disclose their identities and reveal how they did it. It won't surprise you to know, having heard this inventive tale, that many of the group went on to enjoy illustrious careers. Peter Davy was awarded an honorary doctorate after setting up robotics companies, while another, Cyril Pritchett, was a lieutenant colonel in the army. Gonville and Key's officials said the renegades had turned into generous benefactors of the college. Apparently, the reunited group said their only regret was that the car was not left in place forever. Well, the story of the Cambridge prank has captured my imagination and I'm in the process of writing a book on the best student pranks ever seen. The only two golden rules of the student prank are that they should cause no lasting damage to any property or any distress to any individual, and that they should surprise and preferably delight those who encounter them. If you have heard of a prank that deserves a wider audience, I'd love to hear from you. Now listen to the recording again. Objective Proficiency Workbook, 2nd Edition Published by Cambridge University Press, 2013. This recording is copyright.